All right, welcome back to the Now What Podcast. As usual, I'm your host, Aaron Foster. We're going to give a special shout-out to uh, Smarty Pants Vitamins. They are the superstar of this, pod- of this podcast, the title host sponsor. Uh, so go out and get you some if you are in need of some extra nourishment. My man, uh, Nick Wright is in the building. Special guest. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. It's an honor to be on here. Yeah, man. Uh, pleasure is all mine, man. So for people that don't know you, you are a sports commentary analyst. Yeah. And you have your own show on Fox Sports, and it's FS1. FS1 is the FS1. network. FS1. Shows first things first. first. It's me. Chris Carter, Chris Carter, who everybody knows, and Jenna Famer. Wolf, who used to be on the Today Show, she runs with us. So three of us and some guests every morning, six thirty, nine thirty a.m. Eastern. So you guys can do the time zone math on that. For sure, I'm a fan of the show, man. I've definitely checked y'all out. Um, plus, I follow you on on social media networks, so I get the I get the highlights of the show as well. Appreciate man. that. So uh, I appreciate you coming on my show, man. Of course, no, this is great. This is uh. I really listen. There's there's a lot of podcasts, yeah, so few right. people like you have to be very discerning with what you pick and choose to listen to. This is a fun one, and seeing your, I I while I was in Houston, people don't know I did radio in Kansas City, then radio in Houston, right. and now TV the last couple of years. You and I obviously overlapped in Houston, and seeing your evolution from football <clears throat> player with outside interests to what I think a lot of us saw. I, I didn't know what it was going to be, right. but I didn't think you were going to, when you stopped playing football, do what I do for a living, which right. is talk about football <laughs> for a living. So yeah. I'm glad that you found this. And, whoops. And the music's yeah. awesome. And so, yeah, no, it's great to be on here. No, I appreciate it, man. Uh, I try not to talk about football too much, man, but uh, no, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I didn't think I was going to either. It was actually my 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 guy that you met, Humble. <clears throat> he it was actually his idea. He's like, man, you need to start a podcast, man. You got a lot to say, yada yada yada. And at first, I was like, no, fuck that. And then, um, and I did it. And I tried that little try episode. My mother was my first episode, and uh, I liked it. It's, it, it it was like um, it was a way to pick people's brains and use the little bit of reverence that I had to get around uh, people whose minds I respect or don't respect and and have a good honest conversation, man. So it was uh, podcasting. I think is kind of the future. Like radio's dying. Um, things like that. So I think these are the kind of future. Uh, of- I, on demand, everything, video, audio, whatever yeah. it is, seems to be where everything's going. Yep. So like I, <clears throat> I do think now. Listen, maybe this is just because I came up doing radio. I still have a soft spot for radio. Right. I still think. There will be a place, no matter how technology changes, for local radio to a degree because, no, like, listen, if you, you, you still live in Houston, I used to live in Houston, right? Right. The moment the Astros game ends, if you want to talk about the Astros game or hear people talk about the Astros game, you can't wait for the podcast the next day. Like, you know what I mean? If you want to know what the traffic in your city is in that moment while you're in your car, hmm. like, you can't wait. So I think, I, I think there will be some, at least some ways on a local level, but on a national level, right. I think on-demand audio is already starting to replace national radio. Yeah, one hundred percent. And I, man, who knows what the future is going to be? But um, it's definitely how how would something like that get funding though? Like if you're not getting like the ratings of the, you know, it's interesting because like sports talk radio right. ratings typically it gets sponsored at a level higher than its ratings would dictate yeah. because now in cities like New York and Boston, right. it does really well. But Houston sports talk radio does terribly in the really? ratings. I thought yes. it would be better. No, Houston's not a great sports town. Like typically the warmer <laughs> weather, the the less like Miami's not a great sports radio town. Los Angeles Miami's isn't. not a great sports town. Right. Like, like they had they had LeBron James doing had one of the most electrifying basketball teams ever and like the the stadium's never sold out. You know what and I mean? so, right. <laughs> like, so the uh, so, but people, the people who listen to sports talk radio right. tend to skew older, they skew male, and they skew wealthier. Right. So people will spend more ad dollars there. But that's not interesting. Yeah. You don't want to talk about this. That's we can talk true. about no, anything else. Everything is interesting, man. But um, so uh, one of the big reasons that we connected in my latter uh, career is because early on in my career, mm-hmm. you was you was tough on me, man. I, w- I was <laughs> tough on you. Some of it, I, I will say, and we can do it, some of it I would say fair. Some of it, as I reflect back on it, maybe a little unfair. Right. I think I know what's coming. I would imagine if, if it's what I think is coming, it might have been some of more in the unfair moments of my career. But yeah. go ahead. I, I, I don't want to step on you. To the, to the athlete, it's usually all unfair. Okay. So uh, I'll let you be the judge of it. But so, so for people that don't know, um, he was... 
uh, he was a local sports reporter in Houston and at sports the, talk show sports host. talk show host. Excuse yep. me, I want to disrespect the land. No, no, no. I'm just saying, uh, as a, if a, if, as a reporter, you're not supposed to give commentary, right? right, right? right, right, right. I was, I, I was paid to give my opinion. Right, right. Stuff. So, uh, so you had like it was, it was random because it was, it was funny because what happened was, I'll give people the preface to this so they don't think you're just a super asshole. Um, even though I did. So, yeah. <laughs> so that, that, <laughs> that spring, what happened was I, I went through a lot actually. So I, and I don't think you even know this actually. So that spring of the, the spring of 2013, I was lifting weights and I actually slipped uh, a disc in my back. And so I slipped a disc in my back and I recovered from that. Didn't end up getting surgery from that. Um, but through OTAs and, and things like that, uh, what happens with the body is like you you start to over and this is what I learned this is why I had so many like minor injuries was because the body starts to overcompensate like for the kinetic chain yeah your body starts to overcompensate for things and when you're training at the high level that I was like I'm working out three times a day and things like that in order to you know maintain the uh, <clears throat> the level of production that I was trying to have everything starts to just get out of whack and one of the things that that ended up overcompensating is that I had I had I had a huge calf muscle um, injury. And so that derailed me for like two months. I couldn't sprint. And so I'm going into training camp, <clears throat> not being able to uh, sprint fully, still recovering from the bed. I still feel the back a little bit, too. So, you know, everything I'm trying to I'm trying to do everything I can to compensate for that. Uh, and so during the training camp, you know, of course, they don't, they want to keep it under wraps as far as what exactly my injuries are. And so but I have to address the media and the media is saying, like, you don't think you need training camp, yada, yada, yada. And. You know, I have to play it off. I'm like, nah, I don't think I need training camp. I don't think I need the preseason, which in essence, I still kind of feel like a uh, like a, a veteran running back doesn't really, <clears throat> veteran player in general. But um, so that that aspect of it caught your attention. Also, I had a commercial <laughs> with Under Armour, and it was uh, it was it was a stupid little play. It was a little fun pun, like not famous Andy was a guy on there, and mm -hmm. I'm and I'm calling him not oh, famous now Andy. I, now I yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah. So, so, oh, I, so, so, so I'm gonna play the clip of you and then all right, dogging go ahead. me. Uh, yeah, and, and <laughs> keep in mind, people should know this. Go ahead, go ahead. Go this ahead. wasn't on. My local radio show. Right. No, no, this no. This was on NFL Network. It's on NFL Network. It's national TV. Yeah. And uh, you were you were going in, man. And so here is Terrell Davis asking Nick Wright about Arian Foster. Get things going. Uh, December and January. But after coming out the way he did and responding, this season's about Matt Schaub, and I think he got pretty, pretty <clears throat> rave reviews for the first performance. Hey, Nick, Aaron Foster, you know, he, he really didn't, didn't get things going uh, last night. Do you believe it's because uh, he, he, is, he didn't get a lot in the preseason? Oof. Well, I, I think it's a few things. I think Arian maybe needs an attitude adjustment. I'm, I'm, I'm a player's guy. I'm not someone that bangs on athletes. I think they're maybe unfairly scrutinized. But Arian's been, to be fair, something of... I don't know what the right word is. I'll call him a jerk for the last few months to anyone around the team. And you, there's video, and maybe you guys can pull it some point later in the show. Tie game, the Texans are driving for the win. Ben Tate is clearly the better player yesterday. Arian's jogging on the field. Ben Tate waves him off saying Ben Tate is staying in the game. And Arian rips his helmet off and very clearly says some choice words that start with F and then BS and is angry. And that's fine if you're down 35-3. to three. When you are coming back, when Ben Tate is playing better, and when you kind of made a mockery of the preseason, saying, eh, it's not that important, telling the media you don't really want to be a part of it, it I think that's a bad look. And Arian has a commercial right now where he's talking about not famous Andy. And Arian, it's a joke with Under Armour. Arian's kind of treated everyone around him like they're not famous Andy. And right now, that's not, I guess, engendering him too much goodwill in the community. Wow, I mean, that was a uh, pretty strong word right there. But somebody who asked Jay... <laughs> all, right, for, all right, so a few things, if I may. Oh, go ahead, man. All right, first of all, <laughs> it should be known that that was my first and last appearance on NFL Network. That's funny. That was not what Terrell Davis, and now that I hear the question, it's not at all what he really asked me about. <laughs> I clearly had something I wanted to say. Definitely. Um, and, that, and, and the person that took the most issue with it in, the, in real time, by the way, you should know, right. because she's such a loving, lovely woman, was your mother, oh, who course, immediately came at my head on Twitter. Oh, of course. But of I course. didn't know what 
the time, that was your mother. Oh. And so I wasn't rude to her or anything, but it was right. someone had to re- bring to my attention who, who was talking to me. Mom, All right. Mom's with, with the clap. Absolutely. Back. <laughs> Here's what I'll say. I do think, now, I didn't know about the injuries in training camp, and I do think as I've gotten older, I've tried to be better about always knowing there's sometimes things we don't know Mm -hmm. that athletes can't tell us about or their teams don't want them to tell them about, so Mm -hmm. try to give the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. And as I said there, I've never been the guy to bang on athletes. I do think there was a a time in your career in Houston Mm -hmm. where you were so, I guess, over the monotony of the daily media stuff. That happened about year two. Okay. (laughs) And that, that... I thought you were unfair to the people who the daily media stuff Mm -hmm. was their job. Right. I thought, now I I wasn't ever one of those beat reporters, but I know that those people out there, I thought you made their jobs harder than they needed to be. And those are usually pretty shitty, not very well paid, not very somewhat thankless jobs. I agree. And so I. So that's where so that's where I say I'll I'll defend myself a little bit. I clearly was an asshole there. Uh, like that and, and Hey, I appreciate the honesty, man. And if you <laughs> if if I may tell the audience when you and I connected on Twitter, right. I sent you a message that mm-hmm. said, "Hey, uh, you and I got sideways and I and I'll tell you a story that I don't know if you remember, All but right. you and I got sideways while we were in Houston. I want to apologize for that. Mm-hmm. I told you and I respect what you're doing, you know, everything since then. Right. The very first interaction you and I ever had, though, and this one to this day bothers me, and it's not because of anything you did. Because when I got to Houston, I had, I was 27. It was a big job. Went from at radio show in Kansas City to replacing the guy who was the voice of the Texans. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. the biggest show in Houston, right. top <clears throat> five, top six market. Mm-hmm. And I, in Kansas City, I had kind of made my name because... I was really good friends with a bunch of guys on the Chiefs. Hmm. So I got like Turk McBride to this day is one of my close oh, friends. Oh my god, I went, yeah. to, I went to college. With him. Absolutely. Right. So uh I was cool with Glenn Dorsey and Tom Bali. Like I'm not named like those were yeah. they, those yeah. were my guys. So when I got to Houston, I was hoping to do something similar mm. and I had heard enough about you that I was like, I actually think Aaron and I would vibe a little bit. Uh. We're out at training camp. We did our radio shows from training camp, I think my first year there. And it's the day after Tim Tebow is filmed running shirtless as a New York Jet in the rain. <laughs> yeah. And do you remember that? I do. Okay. Unfortunately. So he had then come out to the media and said, oh, I didn't know people would take pictures and I didn't know right. that it would be a big deal. Right. And so I am in one of my many impassioned, maybe slightly over the top, but honest monologues saying these words, Tim Tebow, you're either lying or an idiot. You're either <laughs> lying about it, or you're so dumb that you don't know who you are. And yeah. as I'm saying you're either lying or an idiot, you run past, literally like four feet away, and right. you stop, and you turn to me. You have no idea who I am. You turn and you say, how are you going to say that about that man? You don't know that man. You're going to call that man an idiot? You don't know that man. And then you keep going. And I'm like, oh, oh man. man. <laughs> I'm like, Aaron's never gonna lie. Like, I, Aaron, and, I was, I, I even shouted to you. I was crazy. Like, I, I even shouted. I was like, Aaron, wait, because I was gonna try to explain it, right. but you were gone. And I right. was like, that's gonna be the, the image he has. Like, any chance I had of, I thought at the moment. Now, I obviously didn't help myself a year later doing that right. on NFL Network, but. That, that shit festered, man. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, I'll tell you how I viewed the situation. So, like, I mean, you get criticism all the time when you're a professional athlete, man. Um, uh, I remember seeing that clip because my mother actually sent it to me. She's like, "Look at this asshole," <laughs> and I was like, "God damn!" That's I was like, "That's a little, that's a little, that's a little much, man." Um, and it was, I think, it was a false equivalency as far as like the commercial analogy, uh, but it was just. It was extreme in my opinion, but I never put too much into it because it was just like, because that's why I never responded. I never like mm-hmm. hit you back on Twitter. Like, yep. It was it was never, it was just like, that's fucked up. That's all I thought. I was like, that's fucked up. That dude obviously doesn't like me. And I saw you in passing a few times and I never, I just never thought to like, hey man, what's your problem? You know, it was never that. And and, and even, even you saying that of when I was like, um, hey, you don't know that, man. That was, that sounds like some shit I would do 100%. 
but not necessarily indicative of how I feel because uh, like there, there, there are instances when you like to be playful with people, right? And so that was an instance where I was just trying to start poking fun at you. And you didn't take it that way, but that's that's it's it's kind of how I've, I've always been viewed in in the media's eyes. It's like it's hard. I was actually having a conversation with one of my good friends who uh, helps out at the gym that that we uh, that we run down in in Houston, uh, and he was saying that the way people and this just has to do with any kind of if you hold any kind of reverence in people's eyes at all, and I'm not saying you think of. No, I got it. So if you hold any kind of reverence in somebody's eyes, <clears throat> they automatically view you saying something. In a, in a different light than a regular average citizen. And so, and I was explaining to him, because he was talking talking to me about that, right? And I was explaining to him, like, it's kind of the definition of humility if you walk around thinking that you, people don't think of you like that. And so, it's actually how I feel. Like, so, like, me me coming to say, I'm just joking and shit. I don't, I'm not thinking you're thinking of me, damn, Arian or the an NFL Pro Bowl running back said that to me. Like, For sure. And so, I'm not walking around thinking that. And so, I have to kind of be cognizant and I, th- I think I, 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 I kind of refuse to, and that's kind of my, been my problem is I talk to people like, well, I'm just a regular human, and then they take that as arrogance when it's exactly the opposite. It's actually humility because I don't think of myself in any, any other kind of light. And so uh, it's, 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 it w- it, I found myself in that position a lot, especially with the media. And so like I tried to level with them a lot of the times. And so <clears throat> after practice, I, I understand that it was part of my job. And I don't think it should be, but uh, after practice, you're like you're tired of shit. You want to go home. You're dealing with family issues. You're dealing with a lot off the field, and they come and ask you, "What do you think about Kansas City defense?" And you're just like, "You know what I'm going to say." You well, know that's where to say. listen. That's where the and that's where we in the media, if you will, set athletes up to fail almost all of the time, right? Because if athletes just do every, both teams played hard. On to New England, whatever. We we kill them. We hate it. Mm -hmm. And if athletes give an honest, real answer, we pick that shit apart Mm -hmm. and find anything. It is an almost impossible line we ask guys to walk, which is why... And that was my entire premise with the media. I'm like, if I sit here, it's not to cut you off, but if if I sit here and say the shit that you want me to say, you're not going to get a good interview out of it. But if I say what I really say, like, you're going to feel a certain type of way about it. For sure. So, like, I can't win in this situation, so I'd rather sit here and have a conversation Which is why I will say, which is why I'm so glad to be sitting here talking with you, is I have, over the course of my kind of life covering sports, and I'm only 33, but I've been doing this 10 years, I, or I guess at this point 12, 13 years, I have... Impressive. And I have change to a degree to where I and I say this now on TV all the time I prefer not that this applies to you honest arrogance over false humility and by that I mean like if you think the generic you if you think you're fucking great I would rather you tell me you think you're great rather than act as if you think you're just just a normal guy. So like with we talk we see this with in the NBA all the time, mm-hmm. which is guys, there is nobody really more powerful in athletics as from a player standpoint than the NBA superstar. Right. And because of just a raw numbers game, there's so few of them. Right. Talking about like seven, eight guys in the world. Right. Those all those guys know they're amazing. Yeah. And they and they should, right? <laughs> and, they and, should, so, and they should feel that way. <laughs> and the other thing that I and so that that gets me crosswise sometimes with some of my colleagues that would prefer, at least they pretend they would prefer the the humility. I want to know who you are. Yeah. Like and, and that's and so that's again, that's my own personal evolution. And the other thing that I I that I think in covering sports I've grown to realize is that there's the I, I try to constantly, as I've gotten older, it's made it easier, put myself in these guys' position. So I'll give you an example. This stuff with Odell. So mm-hmm. Odell this this offseason, it appears he got he, I mean not appears. He was photographed in a hotel room. It, it would appear <clears> with <throat> some French Instagram model, I think a blunt, and what looks like some cocaine. Now it doesn't look like he's doing the cocaine. It sure looks like he's smoking the blunt. Right. And and he got destroyed for that. Just killed. Really? I, didn't, and I so, missed this whole way. And so this yeah. happened a few months ago. All right. And I think to myself, if I'm 25 years old, a if, I've got, if I've got <laughs> lifetime money thanks to Nike, I am 
in a league where it's really hard to become a superstar if you're not a quarterback. Mm-hmm. A superstar. Mm-hmm. Objectively, just a wildly attractive human being. <laughs> and, and I'm in Paris for Fashion Week. And I'm single. Could I find myself in a room with an Instagram model, some weed and some coke? Yeah, no question. Like, I am no like, qu- I'm like no if question. that were the, no if those question. were the choices available to me, no question. Could that happen? You could. I won't make this argument, but one could even make the argument. That's the whole goal of how you practice in high school. So one day you can be in the hotel room with the Instagram model and the drugs, and it's the office. And so, I just think when people kill, like, yes, ideally. You're a pro athlete. You recognize I'm waiting for a contract extension. I'm a brand. Nike doesn't. Ideally, everyone operates with the, their grown adult judgment at all times. But it's the same. People people kill athletes that blow their money. Man, I, I'm, I am personally shocked. I'm not shocked it's 50% or whatever it is. It's like I'm, 70. Okay, though, well, like I, I'm shocked it's not 95. Because here's what I know. I, I'm a college graduate. Two parent household, family came. My family wasn't rich, but I didn't. I came out of college with no debt, and I never. You know what I mean? We we grew up very comfortably. Six months after school, I won fifty grand on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Okay, really? Yeah, I did. So I won fifty. Is this on the internet somewhere? It's <clears throat> somehow it's not on the internet. The only copy of it is a DVD in my mom's house somewhere. You gotta let that fly, um, man. You I got. I got to put it out you gotta there. Let so that fly. I won fifty grand on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. <laughs> I am someone who had the accessibility through just calling my mother, what should I do with the money? I had, I, I, I was educated. I had all these things. That money was gone in 10 months. The only thing to show for it is one television. It was... Still got the TV? I still have the TV. Nice. It was gambling. It was exorbitant dinners where I paid for my friends because one thing I realized is that, listen, if all of a sudden, if I can afford to go to Capitol Grill... But my friends want to go to Applebee's. I I still want to go to Capitol Grill, <laughs> and, and I and I and I don't want to eat by myself. So that hill so, is that, that hill is lonely. Right, man. exactly. Yeah. I don't want to eat by myself, uh-huh. and I and so and blown in otherwise less, I, I I you know somewhat unsavory manners. Right, gone. And I knew I'm, I know fifty grand's not lasting me a lifetime, mm-hmm. and I still blew it instantly. Yeah. And so if I was if I was twenty two, and no one in my family's ever bought a house, and no one in my family's ever had money to invest in the stock market. Or go to Applebee's. Uh, or, or, right, it's, <laughs> right. And so I don't even have the infrastructure with which. What do I do with this money? Right. And they hand me a check for a few million. What am I going to do with it? Well, see, this is this is the problem that <clears throat> it, I mean, it really plagues our society, right? Is I mean, it's multi layered. What you what you just said. So, um, the issue is, I think it's a a great problem to have right now but it's just it's just a part of it so I'll, I'll break it down social media is starting to peel back the layers of the facade that we have built in the society for decades and our generation like my generation of athletes we kind of broke the ice and broke the mold of uh, the Marshawn Lynch's the myself um people like that who like these cookie cutter media answers that we were talking about earlier we started to say, you know what, this shit is not working anymore. And because who you are is more exposed and more open because of social media, you're now allotted a little more freedom to be yourself. So where, um, so now if you see like the listen to the press conferences the NBA players give now, mm-hmm. it's like full season. That's like fuck. That's a stupid fucking question. Like, and that's kind of like celebrated now. Whereas yep. when I when I was just saying like you guys need to ask a little better questions, that's like I get killed on NFL Network for it, right? Yep. So we kind of took the bullets for this generation to usher in the honesty. That they're able to to portray. Uh, as far as to your point of of the the blowing the money thing, it the issue is is this. The issue is there's a system set up around athletes uh, that starts with their agent and starts with their financial advisors to, and it's predatory. And nobody ever talks about this. Of course. <clears throat> and so here you have. Uh, a kid who doesn't know how to balance a checkbook has never looked in it. Fi- There's people that go to school to understand finances, how the market works, how the economy works, and then you give a, a, a kid that's not educated in the subject millions of dollars. And then there's these men that that know this and they prey on them and say, 
come with me. There, I don't know how many stories I've, I've heard of guys getting hundreds of thousand dollars stole from Oh, well, and, and there's no sympathy for those guys, by the way. The, it, it, I understand to a degree why people don't have empathy for guys who blow money, even if I do, but I'm a bit of a bleeding heart. But the lack of sympathy or empathy for people who have money stolen from them yeah. is shocking to me. I So I, for the first time in my life, this new job with Fox puts me in a position where I need a financial advisor. I need someone to manage my Shout money. Shout out to right? you. No, that's not. I don't mean it like Fuck that. Fuck that. Enjoy. But, it's cele- I, that, that's, that's an ongoing theme on this podcast. Celebrate your wins, man. Well, so, so but here's the thing that I thought about. Because the, how did I get my financial advisor? My agent at CAA recommended mm-hmm. it. And it's and, the worst thing possible. Well, so, so, and so, and what did I also realize after my first two months of them sending me my monthly statements? My, Fox pays uh, my, my corporation that they handle the whole thing. Mm-hmm. The first couple months doing monthly statements, I wasn't actually going through them quite as closely. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until the end of the year that I wanted to make sure I was fully accounted for. That I went through everything. Mm-hmm. And, and now my fa- financial guy's been awesome. And mm-hmm. like all of it. But they could have been stealing from me. Mm-hmm. I'm, I am I know better than to not be checking. Right. And I still didn't. You know what I mean? And it's so the people, the of course guys. And again, I that was me at th- this, was me this year. 33 years old. Grown man. College educated. Like, yeah. And so it, you expect a 21, 22 year old. And pro sports are the only sports where... And this is not new information, obviously, that your age and your earnings are inversely correlated. Yeah, man. Every other industry, the lo- the least amount of money you're ever going to yep. make is your first paycheck, and the most typically is your last. Yep. Pro sports, it's the opposite, and it's got to last you forever. A lifetime. I, I've, I've advocated for a long time, and nobody agrees with me, but you might. Let's see. All right, let me back up a little bit. I did broadcast journalism at Syracuse. Right. There were... Tons of kids majoring in broadcast journalism that the classmates knew, the teachers knew, everyone knew. that you might be a lot of things in this world. A professional broadcaster ain't one of them. <laughs> Guess what? You let them major in it. It was their dream. Right. Let them major in it. And if it doesn't work out, they'll find something out. Why we don't allow people to major in pro athlete yeah. is beyond me. I've now, seen, that yeah. doesn't mean you major in practicing. You still have the same class load. But let's work on public speaking. Mm-hmm. Let's work on contracts. Let's work on money management. Let's work on the things that you will need if you do make it. Yep. Because if I didn't make it as a broadcast journalist, then yeah, then I kind of should have made it in something else. But it, that was afforded <clears> to <throat> me. Let's allow it to where the guys who do make it are positioned to succeed. Well, the issue with that, I'm, I'm 100% agree. I said the same exact thing on, I went on Rogan's podcast like a year and a half ago. Oh, okay. I said the same thing. We shouldn't be able to major in our sports. Uh, the the issue with that is the NCA would then have to uh, admit that it's a business that they're running. That's the reason why. And until they do that, it, it will never happen. Well, if you wanted to major in your sport, that's true. But if you wanted to major in professional athlete, they I would, don't because because if you're because if you're what you're then doing is is saying okay, teach me how to manage finances, teach me how to time manage, teach me about nutrition, teach me about all of these things. Then they're going to have to say, okay, look at this curriculum. It's what the fuck I'm doing right now. Sure. So show me the difference. Sure. They're that's like, fair. That that cognitive dissonance. No, no, no. That's a fair <laughs> critique. It just, we, there are, and a lot of this, by the way, is, as with almost everything in this country, there are a lot of racial components to it. 100%. Which is, people enjoy pointing and laughing, like the the guy you had on your podcast, Clay Travis majors in this, or at least he used to before he went straight political, pointing and laughing at the athlete who goes broke. Mm-hmm. People love the story of the athlete, typically the black athlete, mm-hmm. who blew it. Mm-hmm. We love that story in this country. Mm-hmm. We, 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 we love the... Because for some reason there has been this belief that the people that make it as pro athletes got lucky, which is... I. It just beyond me. It is the one of the biggest gambles you can ever make is deciding as a preteen yeah. that I, th- I am dedicating myself to this. Mm-hmm. If you decide as a preteen, I'm going to make the Supreme Court. Guess what if you don't quite make it? You almost assuredly have a law degree. You're in a sweet law firm. Like if you come super close and don't make it. If you decide I'm going to be a pro athlete and you don't make it, it's like I can coach. 
I can be a physical trainer, or I've got to pivot entirely. You gotta pivot with man. with no with with no real world like experience for it. Thousand. Percent. And there's eighteen hundred guys in the NFL. There's four hundred and fifty guys in the NBA. There's twenty five. There's seven hundred fifty guys in Major League Baseball, approximately. Right. Here's what I know about none of them. Zero percent of those guys inherited their roster spot from their father. <laughs> Can't say that about the owners. Uh, Can't say that about the owners that we deify. What about Austin Rivers? What? Well, that, <laughs> I'm, you know what? that's true. That's the closest one. I'm just playing. I'm just that, playing. No, no, no. That's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, one. But the, the, uh, the, the way we that's glorify funny. the owners, some of whom are brilliant guys, some of whom just the lucky son, like – some of whom were brilliant businessmen and turned into, I don't know, old, strikes me as kind of racists, like, I don't know, a, an owner that maybe used to employ you and I used to cover. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, like, it's the, the whole thing. Uh, but, and so I just, it is the way, and a lot of that has to do with who covers sports. It's not as much as it used to be, but sports media is still obviously overwhelmingly male but still overwhelmingly white mm -hmm. it skews older mm -hmm. and so for all those reasons <clears throat> like we don't get a fair depiction of the athlete and we don't we don't set up football and basketball players to succeed the way no, we set no up question. athletes that are basically sports that aren't overwhelmingly black like there's a reason that the the Football and basketball players not getting paid, and their the money their sports generate, funding the other sports, yeah, is one of it's hilarious. Well, I, I'm glad you have a good disposition about it. I find it wildly racist. You gotta, you gotta laugh at life. Like they, <laughs> they, what what you have is there's every people talk about. I was actually in I was actually in class in college one time, and we had a we had a class debate going on, um, and. There was a swimmer, a, a woman swimmer, that we had this open debate, and the the debate was like, should college athletes be paid? And I was like, if I have a I have an athlete in here, no question, she's gonna be on my side. So I start stating my case, and she raised her hand. She said, like, absolutely, we shouldn't. I said, well, excuse, like it blew my mind. I didn't have a, I didn't have a uh, retort, and she starts explaining. She's like, we're you know we're we're not professionals, we're we're amateurs, yada yada yada, and uh, and I was like, yo, we pay for eighty percent of this campus. What are you talking about? Like, what, 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 this is a business. And she's going to, she's like, yeah, but we're still amateurs and yada, yada, yada. And I'm just like, how do you, how are you even making this argument? Well, that's, that's a circular, that's a snake eating its tail. Well, well of course. You shouldn't get paid because you're amateurs. Why are you amateurs? Because you're Cause not you getting get paid. paid. Well, of course. I mean, and, and explaining that to people is, they would have to have a basic, um, uh, understanding and, um, foundation of, of logic. And most humans don't in but this there's, society. But the, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. But the, but the, but the point is the, that they have convinced people that this is a valid, uh, reason to not pay. They, they, they've convinced it. And like, once people are convinced, like logic goes out the window. Right. There once is you, no... you, listen, <clears throat> anyone that wants to sit there and, and act like, they have logic on their side to argue. We decided room, board, and tuition were a fair trade-off before the games were televised. And they're still a fair trade-off after there's billion-dollar television deals. They're not interested in, act in discussing logically. <clears throat> but the, the should athletes be paid component is almost a separate discussion to the one that I think is fascinating, which is why aren't they and who benefits? And what we have is... A situation where people bring up the guys who make it. They bring up Arian Foster. They're like, hey, Tennessee was a great deal for you. Even if, it, whatever it is, mm -hmm. look at the platform it gave you. Mm -hmm. I, With respect, I don't, maybe it was for you. It what, wasn't. Okay, sure. But let's, <laughs> let's, let's throw that out for a second. All right. The, the guy, the mobile quarterback, over, Todd Reesing, he's a white guy, by the way. Uh, he was... The quarterback, the Kansas Jayhawks. He's a mobile quarterback. He's well, he was to white guy. Three. Yeah, high, high motor. The, sure, <laughs> a, a, a sneaky fast, but uh, <laughs> coach's son. But he was the quarterback for the Jayhawks. The one year the Jayhawks were good. Okay. Akeem Talib's year. Okay. The Mark Mangino Orange Bowl. Year. Right, right, right. All right. He was never going to be a pro. There was about an eighteen month period where he was the <clears throat> most famous athlete in the state of Kansas. Hmm. I don't know what Todd Reesing does right now. I do know, and I lived there then. Mm. 
In those 18 months, he could have made a million dollars in endorsements. He, the odds are most people will never be able to make that amount of money in a year or in 18 months in their life. Yeah, yeah. They deprive him of that ability, his right. peak earnings potential of his life. And But the, the component of it is what you have is a wealth transfer. You have wealth generated by football and basketball. Who plays football and basketball? Overwhelmingly black. Overwhelmingly poor black kids play those sports. Where does that money go? To pay for the swim team, to pay for the soccer team, mm -hmm. to pay for the golf team. So what you have is <clears throat> wealth generated by the inner city that is then given to mostly white, well-to-do kids who are playing the other sports. Mm -hmm. That's goddamn offensive. Like, that is, that is, that that is... And the reason why I laugh at it is because... Um, this this industrial complex that you're explaining it directly mirrors our society f since its since its inception. Sure. So, and this is why people like to make it analogous to slavery because you have poor blacks funding an entire structure, an entire school, an entire city. Like the school I went to, University Not of Tennessee, so. that city's lifeblood is the football. Is team. the University of Tennessee? It, it, I mean, is it, is the football team? So um, that's why it's analogous to slavery. Um, when you look at um, all of all of the other moving parts around it, the reason why I mean I, I made this point, but it's just the the reason why people refuse is because th they'll have to sit up on this throne that they have justified for years and years and then there's talk they'll, they'll be talk about back payment and it's just a snowball effect of things that they'll have to correct i'm talking about uh health insurance for players like sure. one of my one of my buddies <clears throat> he uh he he paralyzed uh his his whole his whole right arm is he cannot use his right arm anymore inky johnson very well known oh yeah eric speaker. berry's guy yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, we all we were all in college at the yep. same time, and I was on the field when it happened. And so, like, he can no longer use his arm. Like, there's no reason why the NCA needs to pay. There's no reason why the the NCA needs to pay uh, doesn't pay his his medical bills for life, for life. So what I mean, what I was saying was, I mean, there's 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 no way that they can um, they have they have to they have to die on this hill <laughs> because you know, if they don't die on this hill. The, the ramifications are it's it's opening up the floodgates and people people squirm i mean and they it's really why i'm not, sorry no but it's really why people still die on this hill of uh i don't want to get too political but like why black folks don't deserve reparations right and i'm not an advocate of giving everybody a check for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. that's the stupidest shit you could do but it's why there's like no there, there can't be any reparations how would you divvy it out but it's because um the the floodgates would be open. This 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 government still hasn't acknowledged the fact that this that that this country was built on the slave labor of of black folk, and so and they've 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 given out semi reparations to to Native Americans and Japanese and all these other everybody else but black people. But there's a reason why it's because the ramifications for it would be monumental, monumental. And so it's the same kind of it's the same kind of fun. So when people it 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 bothers the shit out of me when people say how could you, how dare you compare NCAA athletes to slavery like drop your ego for a second and understand it's an analogy nobody's saying that they're picking cotton but well and the and for people that services. people that squint or squirm or hate this the slavery analogy let me let me give you one that maybe you'll be a little more comfortable with how do you feel about indentured servitude? I made that same. So, so, so if I don't people, know why you hated me, man? We have no, a no, lot no, of the right, same. That's what I'm saying. I didn't hate you. I think you hated me. I, I was out busy giving hot takes, and I and sometimes you sometimes your gun miss aims. Well, matter of fact, I need some uh, I need some back pay for this show yeah. you got because you built. <laughs> so, so if people don't know, they like, how did how did indentured servitude work? I'll give you the very the the wiki version, the the base the the quick version. I you know what I mean? I'm a I'm a farmer in Ireland. I really want to get to the United States. Mm -hmm. I cannot get there on my own. In order for you bringing me to the United States, I agree to work for free, aside from room and board, for two, three, four, five years in order to pay you back for that and get my opportunity to live my life in the United States. Yep. Now, that's not an <laughs> apples to apples analogy, but it ain't apples to bowling balls either. Like, mm -hmm. I, I would like to get to the NFL. My only path to the NFL is college football. Okay, come play for us 
for three three years minimum, and that's the other part of it. The fact that there's this minimum, I know the vast majority of guys couldn't come after high school freshman right. year anyway, but it's absurdity. Come play for us for this amount of time, mm -hmm. and that will afford you the opportunity that you want. It's, I mean, you can't dismiss it out of hand, mm -hmm. you, you, just flatly. But the you mentioned reparations, and I I'll be totally honest. This is I consider. Outside of sports, the area that I am most educated on is American history from the end of the Civil War, basically the start of Reconstruction, mm -hmm. until the passage of the Civil Rights Acts. And so, like, that 80, that, I guess, 100 years is really, like, the area I think I know the most about. Despite that, shamefully, I don't know a ton about the reparations movement since then, at least not nearly enough to talk about it educatedly. Mm -hmm. But I... But what I what I could talk like the you mentioned Native Americans and Japanese and and I am not in any way trying to shortchange the absolute terrible deal Native Americans have had in this country for as long as they haven't been the only people in this country. But there's been one constant in this country since basically its inception, which is there has been some uh, social mobility amongst racial groups if you look at like the racial situation in america is almost like a totem pole like the i'm italian right, right. at one point italians were were shit on mm -hmm. and then italians basically at one point became white as mm -hmm. long as like the <laughs> like it just and so you're right 100 the man. the the one constant in that has been black folks have always been at the bottom mm -hmm. and a lot of political parties have changed hands and elections have been won by reminding people that aren't black but that are getting screwed that hey listen here's what we can promise you at least you're not at least black. you're not black <laughs> and if you if you read a lot of the a lot of the testimonials and documents from the people when the, while secession was going on mm -hmm. During the war or post-war, mm -hmm. a lot of it was, and by war I mean civil war, right. a lot of it was the promise that the poorest, most poor-off white person would always have it better than the best, and they wouldn't say black person or African American at the time. And that was, and you can see that thread weaving its way through basically the entirety of American history. And so the reason that, why, listen, I'm a sports guy, why, why, it is I think it's almost impossible to talk about sports without a pretty, at least talk about it well, without a pretty decent understanding of the history of race in this country yes. because it's, the sports commentary is mostly a lot of white folks talking about black folks. Mm -hmm. And if sports commentary, as the clip you played in the beginning, has evolved from just talking about what y'all do on the field mm -hmm. to talking about you guys as people, yeah. off the court, off the field, right. and... So, so understanding the racial dynamics in this country are key to, I think, having any informed opinion on almost anything, but particularly on sports. You're a hundred percent right, and I mean, uh, uh, a situation directly applicable to this is when Adrian Peterson got had to sit out of here because he disciplined his kids. You know, I you know <clears throat> I broke that story. I did not know you broke. That I story. had the police report. I had the yeah. that was the uh, that was the. I guess there's two times I've been on NFL Network now. That's the, <laughs> the only time I got invited back you, was when I had the Adrian Peterson stay story. fucking running backs, but, bro. But yeah, <laughs> but go go ahead. Talk, no, talk but, about that. So so um, when the story broke, right? I was. I'm mean, using twenty dollar word here. I was flabbergasted that there was an uproar, because in our communities, it's commonplace to discipline like this, right? It's commonplace. It wasn't till it was a national conversation that I started talking to other races about it. Like, I mean, granted, I grew up in a domestically violent household, so I knew mm -hmm. we took it over the top. But in everybody else in my neighborhood, all the ca all the cats I told was like, you, you go get the switch. Like, you're in trouble, right? It was just, it's so commonplace. But if you follow the lineage and the history of where we learned that from, discipline by by beating, where did that come from? That came from slavery. Like that's exactly where it came from. You're talking about the plantations, and you get whipped, and then and then that. I mean, you you monkey see, monkey do. I mean, that's an awful analogy. But when when that's how that, that's how they got disciplined. Their kids discipline their kids like that. Their kids they discipline like that. And it's it's directly correlated. And <clears throat> and listen, the the Peterson thing. I 
I saw <laughs> because that I had the whole police file. I had a 45 minute recording of Adrian admitting to all of it proactively, right. thinking he had done nothing wrong. Mm-hmm. Given the photos that I saw that weren't public, he. He he went further than you probably, would be comfortable with. Probably, I, the, probably. <clears throat> but the the cultural divide on that is real. That yeah. And Tanahasi Coates writes about this in not his most recent book, the one uh, we were eight years in power about president about the Obama presidency among other things, but the one that was basically a, an essay to his son, uh, between the world and me. Uh, he he writes about how. <clears throat> and he doesn't make the point you make. He made the point because that book's mostly or a la- large part about police violence against right. black community. That my dad, I, I need my dad felt that I needed to have the fear of God in him because of how dangerous the world was for me. Part of it is, well, and yeah. that there was an element of, and so this is what you're talking about is for me, a very personal one. So I'm, I mentioned off the air. So I'm, I've been with my wife 10 years. I've been married five, but I also have, so we have three kids. I'm 33. The kids are 20, 13 and five. The 20 year old and 13 year old are my adopted kids, her biological kids. Mm -hmm. It's relevant here because she's black. And so she, until I came around when Demonze, our oldest was 10, Diora was two, almost three, but she had been a single mom on her own the entirety of the time. Mm-hmm. And I grew up upper middle class suburban white household. And when Demonse was 10, 11, 12, she, I don't think she'd be mad at me saying this. Like she absolutely, she didn't never use a switch, right. but she executed spankings or whoopings as she would call it. Mm-hmm. And... Early on, before I had, before we were married and before I'd adopted the kids, I got no standing to say anything, right? right? But that shit turned my stomach. Right. I went to her and I finally said, listen, I can't tell you what to do, but tell me if you're going to, because I got to leave the house. Like mm. that, it, it made me nauseous. Right. I also, though, as I kind of learn more and grew like again i don't now we have we have our the baby or she's not even a baby anymore she's almost five uh i don't spank i it's not how i came up it's not how what i know but i understand why a single mom by the way working a few jobs might need to use what i think is the most in real time effective discipline for an illogical child which is and I'm going to say something that uh, if like if this gets aggregated by a blog it'll it'll look like a bad quote but whatever. You can also see like man I ride the subways in New York and there is and I'm not saying this is there, there is a cultural difference if I'm speaking in broad strokes between the level of disrespect little white kids will show their parents and the level of disrespect <laughs> little black kids will show their parents. Now, that is I mean, not... It's, a, it's an ongoing joke in the comedy community. Right. Well, that is right. not across the board. And right, that of course is, not. I'm just painting not. with a very broad brush. Right, right, right. But there are... People get very uncomfortable talking about these types of things when it comes to race. But, like, everyone acknowledges that, like, black people and white people have different dishes on Thanksgiving mm-hmm. in general. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, the, the the go to church differently yeah. in general. You know what yeah. I mean? But there are certain things where... Co- church music. Church music. Like, there's a lot of things. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are cultural differences. Now, I don't believe any of those differences are inherent, like like in your DNA Not when you're either. born. But it's... And so except the... For, except for maybe, maybe rhythm. Rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, and so, like, there's... The, the, but that was the Adrian Peterson thing was where it was, I, I will add one little bit of nuance to it. That was broken down on racial lines, but it was also broken down to a degree on geographic lines. Cause a lot of white S- folks that grew up in the South. S- Southern. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Well, just looked at whoopings and, as part of. And where was slavery prevalent? Sure. It's in the South. Like if you follow that lineage, it's, it, it makes perfect sense. And that's why like, I mean, I, I didn't grow, I grew up in the Southwest and in the West coast. So, uh, but my, but my father is like an old school, you know what I mean? So like we got whoopings. And so it, when, when it, when that story broke, I mean, I had got whoopings growing up and knew they were, knew they were over the board and, and all the turmoil we went through growing up. Like I, I knew what it was, but when the story broke, I had never thought about, uh, disciplinary action in my household or anybody else's household in any kind of detail after I was out of my household. Like it never, never, never brought up, never got talked about it in class and that. But when I started to dig into the story and started to dig into the ramifications that he was going through and and his like 
the fact that he admitted it fully. But he, I, I said that, man, he would have passed a polygraph that I am a great father. He truly, he told the story to the police officer. Uh, he was like, they, the police officer asked him, did you ever beat um, him with an extension cord? And his answer was, oh, no, 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 no. I got beat with an extension cord. Yeah. I know how much that hurts. But he, I really, not to play pop psychologist, Arian, or Arian, sorry, Adrian Peterson was what I would consider clearly abused as a child. Just beat with an extension cord, beat with a lot of stuff. Right. When he said he wanted to play football, his uncle, when he was a little kid, took him to football field, had him wear no pads, and tackled his ass. It was like, you better be ready for this. And if you're Adrian Peterson, he's and you're- That's why he's so nice. And you're, but, <laughs> but also, if you're from where he's from, yeah. and you love those people mm-hmm. to this, you're not mad at them, you love them. Right. I think in your head, you're like, that made me me. Oh, and guess what? You know, d- exactly. I'm the most successful person in the history of my city. Yeah. I I, I would be doing my kid a disservice if, if I, I didn't. didn't. Di- exactly. And so I I thought what he did was horrifying, but I also think he thought he was doing the, the right, right thing. thing. Yeah. And but that's that's the cultural difference is 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 exactly what I'm talking about. It's hard to um I mean it's it's kind of the point I wanted to bring up earlier is like <laughs> we live in the same place. But we absolutely live in different realities. Everybody lives in a different reality. Like the like my world. It, I mean, it kind of got. It, it gets kind of deep because like your worldview shapes you a hundred thousand percent. Of course. And your worldview is directly affected by the environment that that you were brought up in. And so here you have a cat that uh, was abused as a child, um, but still is is loved by his family. Yada yada yada. Uh, I don't think has put any deep thought into where that came from. Why is it that they hit me? Yada, yada, yada. Um, so then he's like, well, I got to do it to my kids. I came out great, right? right? I'm successful. I came out great. Why wouldn't I? Like you said, I'd be doing a disservice if I didn't. And so if, if and this is why education is, is key, but what I'm saying is nobody it walks this earth with the exact same point of view. And so we're all trying to, and this is why, <clears throat> like a lot of right wing rhetoric bothers me nowadays because they're like, "Oh, you're trying to limit free speech uh, by by being politically correct." And I'm like, "No, you're not. This is this is what political." And I used to be, I used to be on the other side of being politically correct. I'm like, "Say what you feel," but all, and I, I've totally pivoted from this position. But all political correctness is, is it's uh, it's an attempt at like goodness when goodness is subjective. And so we all have to have this, like this level playing field that we're playing on. That's all political correctness is. It's not this, I'm trying to stop you from doing what you do or feel how you feel. But it's like, I don't know where you come from in your circumstances. You don't know where I'm coming from. So let's meet at a level where we can both speak the same language. Of course. And it costs you nothing. Yeah. That's the other thing. Mm-hmm. If I, if you, if you learn as you go on that, let me think of one that has, that I've learned re- recently, right? If you learn as you go on that the term I mean, tranny is offensive, right. right? Right. It costs you nothing to stop saying it. Yeah. It costs you nothing. Right. And it is the, and by the way, a lot of the anti-political correctness rhetoric is totally bankrupt of any consistency. Because a lot <laughs> I mean, of the folks I mean. <laughs> that are that are so... Oh, we're getting too politically correct. Mm-hmm. Let someone come out there, and I would, I do not feel this way. I would not say this. But let someone come out there and say, bleep the troops. Right. That's politically, that, the only reason you don't say right. that is because it's not politically correct. Right. And, and see how those same people feel right. about that. Like, there are. The, I've, I've seen it plenty of times, and what they do is they say, um, uh, it's because, so, so that, that whole Colin Kaepernick situation was. Uh, at first, they were like, "You need to stand, you need to kneel," and then they realized the inconsistency in that worldview. So they pivoted from that. I mean, there's there's plenty of videos of of, of the juxtaposition mm-hmm. of their of their position, um, but they'll they'll they they'll say, um, "I respect their right to do it, but I I, I disagree with it." Yeah, like, listen, that, 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 that's but that's a a, the, the, the cap thing. Everyone knows this is true. The if when Colin Kaepernick was initially seating seat, seated. Because he remember he kneeled because a freaking green beret said that's the more respectful way to do it. Yeah. Everyone forgets that. But if when he was first asked, "Why are you not standing for the anthem?" his answer was, "I will tell you why I'm not standing for the anthem. 
no one protects that flag the way our troops do. Yeah, he's <laughs> and I feel like our VA system is a mess. I feel like it is shameful that uh, our returned military commits suicide at three X or whatever the rate of the general population. Mm -hmm. I think the unemployment and homelessness rates absurd. And until we take care of our troops who protect that flag, I will not stand for the flag. If that was his message, he would still be disrespecting the flag the exact same way. Mm -hmm. And all the people who hate him would absolutely applaud him. They did not care about the flag. They cared about what people have always cared about in this country, getting angry about at least certain people, which is black folks asking for equal rights. Right. And as soon as, and it does, and the vessel is, oh, oh, Cap's complaining. He made it. Why, why, why would he complain? The idea, how fucked would we be if everyone who made it out of a tough situation, and I'm not saying Cap's situation, home life or anything was tough, but just if, if everyone <laughs> that made it, it, their reaction was, well, I made it. I don't have to worry about anybody else. Yeah. Like what? The, what would we do if every cancer survivor was like, oh, good for me. <laughs> right. I don't got to worry about donating any money. I'm not marching. Or, or I participate in any walks. Like, right. it's just, it is totally disingenuous. Right. And so. But that, that the, the um, that's the tough part, right? Is I, I was, uh, the, the day of the first game on 9-11 when the protest took place, he did it all preseason. And then what happened was, uh, it started getting the national conversation during preseason, and then the first game. Before the first game, like we had a league wide like group text chat, right? Um, and like guys were going back and forth on what they were going to do, how they were going to support, yada yada yada. And um, I had a uh, I had a conversation um, with uh, Michael Bennett against uh, I played for the Seahawks. We yep. played the Seahawks game one, and they decided to lock arms. And I told I told, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not. You're talking about this past season? No, no, the first, the very first so two season, two seasons, ago. 2016. Yeah, I was still playing. Yep, two seasons. Ago. Um, uh, like this was when it was still like the yep. national conversation, and I got death threats and all that shit. Um, but uh, and I'm not saying anything against his views, but it's when the Seahawks locked arms and and guys were talking about locking arms and putting up a fist and yada yada. And I I left the text group after I said I was like, yo, you guys are being cowards. If you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna uh, support them, support them. But like you're doing exactly the opposite of what he's trying to do by this fake. Uh, support. I just I, I just disagree. So I was like I'm out. Um, but I was having a conversation with Michael Bennett, and this this was the 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 crux of of, of the issue. And it's and it's hard right now because what it is is we're still fighting injustices and and racism that is uh, systemically implemented, right? But the issue, and I told him this, is the issue is. Uh, it's, I think it's harder than our, our parents' fight and our grandparents' fight. And the, the reason I say that is this, is uh, the fight is convincing people that there's a fight, right? And the um, the amount of Stockholm Syndrome that's implemented, that, that's, that comes to play, is, 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 is a huge factor in as well. Because you got people like Candace Owens. And and you know Kanye West dumped, jumped on the on, on the bandwagon as well. Where they're sitting there saying you're not a victim, you black people need to pull themselves up at their bootstraps and yada yada yada. Well, I, I agree to a certain degree of that, but like you're being very disingenuous about the actual issues at hand. Uh, but it fits their it's their worldview and the narrative. But that's th that's the main point is that that people who fight these injustices, the criminal justice system, uh, uh, police over-policing, the police force, or just in general, all, all, all of these issues have been fighting for years, but the fight now is entirely different. It's just trying to convince people that there is a fight. Because, men, you can drink out of the same water fountain, people feel like, oh, it's all good. Or because you're, you you live way better than a third world country. But by the way, by mm -hmm. the way, that, that, that drink out of this, this, we can drink out of the same water fountain, but it would appear, at least as of late, I'm not sure we can swim in the same pool. We certainly <laughs> I saw that. we, cer I we, saw that, we yeah. certainly can't sell lemonade on the same block. I saw that. We certainly can't cross the same streets. Like I saw that. Th yeah, there's not. But see, this this is th th to your point, and this is why social media is slowly peeling back how people feel. Right? <clears throat> social media is 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 put it, is amplifying things that people are going through. So while race relations might seem high, there it's probably a little better than it. Of course, it was like during the civil rights movement. But what it's what it's what it's doing is, and this is why I hate when people say, you know, like cats like Ben Shapiro or, um, excuse me, like those right wing cats who like like the facts doesn't or the the, the studies don't say this, the, uh, the blah 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 blah. All this is like, how the f how can you quantify somebody saying you you can't swim in this pool? How many instances like that are not being recorded and posted on Facebook? There's 
th- thousands. It happens all the time. People, people like like living as a black man. Like I don't know how many times I, I, shit this has happened to me, and and I, things that probably people. Uh, probably didn't even recognize as racism has happened to you. The, but you cannot quantify this shit. Well, and, but the thing is this, e- the stuff that is quantifiable, those folks are lying about. Like, I, uh, 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 the Clay, w- w- who did all this, all this nonsense. He backpedaled when he was about, on my podcast. Like, I, I, and I, with, with respect, I, I, oh, I, I, I refuse to listen to he it. Moon, no. He moonwalked. No, l- listen, because he knows better. Because yeah. he, because uh, some of these folks are true believers, and some of these folks are playing a character for profit. And that's, oh, and, that, that's the dangerous part of and today. And here's bro. the thing I do not mind, and this might bother you as a former pro athlete. People that play characters for profit about who, uh, if, if someone wants to go on TV and be like, you know what, Tom Brady actually not good at football, and here's why. Oh, Skip I'm gonna I'm, no, I actually think Skip's great. However, no, but, he, but he, the, he he takes Skip, but I think I think Skip, he takes provocative stances. I think Skip believes everything he's saying. Yeah. I also should mention, by the way, Skip shows the show directly after mine on FS1. Six th- my show six thirty nine thirty Eastern. I appreciate, shows I appreciate the full disclosure, man. Uh, and so, but if you about things that don't actually matter, right? Like in reality, sports are all make believe. Uh, Dion, one of my favorite people of all time. I had a podcast with him. Mm-hmm. He was like, "Yo, I created prime time. I I created that character right. in order to so, build prestige." So stuff that does not actually matter. If you want to either say something you believe but just put way extra on it right. or even just be – I think it's very hard to do television or radio or media every day and say things you don't believe because you'll be found out. Yeah. You'll, the inconsistency yeah. will show up. But you're not actually hurting anybody. Yeah. I mean, it's entertainment. It's entertainment. Right. <clears throat> but when you do it about what has been, I would say, is the single most pressing issue in the history of this country. Right. It has real effects on people. And when you make the argument, white people are more likely to be shot by the police than black people, and you don't adjust for percentage of the population, right. you are reckless and you know better. Yeah. You, you, but, you, the, but a lot of people don't. That's well, the thing. Well, no, but typically the people making the argument Dude, know better. You're right, you're right. But the people consuming it don't. Don't, right. When you, when, and here's why I'm not hopeful or optimistic about a lot of this i'm a pessimist for a (laughs) lot for as long as there have been uh, i'll stick on the police thing for a minute police in this country black folks in this country have said we get treated differently we get beat on we get hemmed up for things we didn't do Mm -hmm. and forever in this country white folks have said some again i'm speaking in generalities right. some variation of you're lying yeah. you're exaggerating you brought it on yourself yeah. and then everyone got a camera in their pocket started to document it and instead of the reaction of the greater white community being holy shit i am sorry we were wrong right. we didn't know how can we help it has been the opposite since there has been This is verifiable. Folks can look it up. Since there has been over the last, basically since Trayvon and Tamir, but really since there have been the super public videotaped, Mm. uh, you know, Walter Scott, whomever you want to pick, horrifying shootings of unarmed black people by police. The approval rating for the police by white people Mm -hmm. has gone up. Of course. And so the, the... the, the, the reality is, like, at some point, you get the police force you demand, mm-hmm. you get the politicians you demand, mm-hmm. and I it's unfortunate, but there's a lot of people that can look at the same situations that I look at or you look at, and their reaction can be exactly right. <laughs> yeah. That's what you're yeah. here for, hundred percent, and that's dangerous. But it's man. a lack of it's a lack of understanding our history, right? So, and people are like, "Oh, you got to get over slavery," and it's like nobody's sitting here thinking about slavery all day. But the ramifications that slavery had on our country still reverberate through our society today. So, the fact that we have a police force, it was implemented for slaves. That was the cap thing <laughs> that he got killed for the yeah. T-shirt or whatever, right? And it's hard to convey a nuanced <clears throat> message via T-shirt, yeah. But historically, it wasn't. It wasn't. It totally. It wasn't wrong. Like right. it was. It was the very shortened. It was the tweet version right. of it. But people bring up slavery. Okay. 
again, this is where people, this is why I think history is so important. And I wish I knew more about world history. I wish I knew more about outside of this country, but there's so much to know I mean, in yeah, so you, little You can time. never do anything. Um, <laughs> so there's been forever. And this is something that I would argue a lot, a lot of times black folks even give black folks a hard time about, which is owning a car for you own a house, right? Mm. Or, or, or having a bend in a, in a, in a project driveway or mm. whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a reason for that, right? All right. So up until 1968-ish, black folks really couldn't own a house in this country. It was, yes. it, it, so, so you have entire communities redlined. You, you have, you have essentially, and I don't even need to get into redlining or the creation of the ghettos any of that. Let's just talk about the cliche: why you buy that fancy car instead of a house. Mm -hmm. Up until forget slavery, 40 years ago, the nicest thing a black person could practically own in this country was a car. Mm -hmm. So guess what? You're going to take pride in that. Yep. You're going to, and the pride you take in that, your kid's going to see. Mm -hmm. And so like you, if you strip an entire, and by the way, what is the way white families that aren't rich, that don't have some big inheritance, pass down wealth? The house. Yep. You know what I mean? They, they, they didn't have to. Granddad died with no money. Mm. He wasn't wealthy, but he owned his house. Mm -hmm. So now we can either live in it or we can sell it. Like so, when you've only been able to legally, practically, without federally legalized housing discrimination, own a home for forty some odd years <laughs> yeah, in this it's country. One generation. It's man. not about it's slavery. And by the way, contrary to what some of these assholes will tweet to you slavery was not 400 years ago mm. it was a, i mean so it was 150 years ago right that's there i mean that is we can go down the like the same way john tyler and people can look up what president he was some of his grandchildren are still alive today mm. like which is weird i think he was having kids when he was like 80 but not the point hey, shout, um, out, shout out to him uh the <laughs> people act like things didn't happen that happened and people act like things that were going on when my dad was a teenager. Yeah, were 150 years ago. I mean, my dad. Were. My dad had to be in the house uh, by what? By the time the street uh, there was martial law in Los Angeles, and he had to be inside the house by when the street lights came on. So this is this is the problem that that I, that, I, that I just talked about is like you're still convincing people that yo there's still shit to fight about, and their retort is it's 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 all good. Well, th this is this is the this is the issue that I always I always find hilarious, and it's always contradicting with these. Uh, um, conservative talking heads is they'll say, "Hey, if if there's any racist law or anything like that, I'm with you. I'll fight you 100." percent Okay. Um, well, let's talk about how our community's education system is underserved. Like that that that's not, there's no there's no direct law saying all the black or poor brown people uh, neighborhoods should have shitty schools. There's no law that says that. But there's a reason why that has been the case, and it has been leaning towards that. For decades, just, just but like, they won't. They they won't admit that. They won't admit the fact that there there needs to be some kind of ramifications to undo the shit that has been done. Because when you talk about when you talk about black kids uh, wanted to wanted to buy jewelry and cars and have that little pride that yeah, you know what reverses that is education. And you know what the word who has the worst education system in our country, black folks. And how do we fund education in this country for the most part? Property taxes. Property taxes. And so what? Privatized prison. It gets deep as shit. But when you get when you when you start to go into these things, they pivot and they have to pivot because they don't have another intellectual. And, and I wanna and I wanna make a point because you've said you've said a few th times like right wing or conservative or whatever it is. I I would implore folks. To stop thinking about talking about race as if you're talking about politics. Because I do want people to understand, if they want to take it to their furthest logical conclusion, huh. that if you, if you are, if you think that advocating for racial equality is a political position, then you must then be acknowledging that there is a political ideology that is against racial equality. So if you think me coming on here and talking about history of racism in this country and racial issues and equal rights is a liberal position, then a direct line of logic is the conservative position must be against those things or vice versa. It's definitely, so it's if, definitely nuanced, right? It's definitely, there's definitely nuanced. I'm not saying you, but no, 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 uh, no yeah. but, but, but I, I mean, it's a fair point you bring up and 
Because I don't uh, think talking about race is talking about politics. But I think talking how, about race is talking about equal you, rights. How can you divorce race from politics? A very hard time. I, well, that's well, that's what I'm saying. So, so when you say when you say um, if I'm if I'm talking about conservative viewpoints, well, it is most of the conservative. And when I say conservative, I mean I'm 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 strictly talking about like mostly policies implemented, right? Sure. So I'm not talking about a rich white man in a suit. Um, whatever imagery you have in your head, that's your bias. It's not I'm talking about you. I'm talking yeah. about in general, like people. Um, but so when you talk about um, not if 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 not wanting to to because you'll you'll have a lot of conservative talking heads say I'm a classical liberal, right? I'm a classical liberal because they don't want redistribution of wealth, things like that. Um, but that's why I say you can't really div divorce uh, race and politics because if 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 you want to if you want to distribute wealth you want to tax wealthy people and then distribute that to uh, lower income neighborhood schooling system that's a liberal position not sure. a conservative position absolutely but it's 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 directly it's the cousin of race that's why I say classism is the cousin of racism I I, I agree with that the point that I the the point that I'm trying to hammer home is there are there are a lot of people who have decided that it's what Jamel Hill deals with, right? Mm -hmm. I there before Jamel went at Donald Trump, she was considered someone. You know what? I'll take Jamel out of it because Jamel's become so polarizing. Right. My friend Bomani Jones. I think he's brilliant. He's, brilliant. Uh, he's the, the I'm going to say something seeped in ego. He's the only guy on sports TV that I think smarter than I am. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, no, and uh, Bomani is brilliant. Bomani went to college at 16, has yeah. a double master's, yeah. is in economics. Like, he is legitimately, yeah. testably brilliant. Bomani has tweeted 400,000 times. Mm -hmm. Never once about Democrat, Republican. Never once about who to vote for. Right. Never once about actual politics. But he talks about race. Right. And he gets he gets thrown at him all the time. You're an example of ESPN being too political. If you think if you the viewer consumer take any position on race as political, then I would ask you what are your politics and why do you feel that way? Right. Because I do uh, absolutely policy has racial implications yeah. and we can see that there is right now there's there's you know there's a party in this country that tends to be more racially sympathetic and one part that seems to be more racially I mean that's right. that's provable. But I would if I were if people are watching they can probably figure this out. I would not I don't consider myself a conservative. But if I were to consider myself a conservative I would like to think I would be offended by the idea that advocating for racial justice is a liberal position. Because <laughs> well, that's because it, you're a liberal. Right. <laughs> Maybe. Because or, because because now uh in this climate and I don't want to get into Trump at all, but what has happened is the platform of Donald Trump, the platform of um these conservative talking heads now being called a racist is almost a badge of honor. It's almost like that means not that I'm racist, but that means that, um, uh, I'm 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 not I'm, PC. I'm, I'm not PC, and I'm I'm, I'm it's it's, ex, it's it's an affirmation of my worldview because I don't think I'm racist, but the fact that you think I am that just means you're a lost liberal snowflake, yada yada yada. Like it's an affirmation. It's become a badge of honor, and that's why um, I I don't um, I don't like to call people racist unless they're verifiable. Like I think that you are more superior, or I think I am more superior than you because of this, because of that. It's hard to. Um, throw that term around for me right now because it is being thrown around so much, right? Um, but people in people in general now, like when you, it, it's 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 hard to have these conversations because um, uh, social science is not an exact science, and you're you're not you, but people are trying to bring in data and inside of social science that isn't necessarily like i said quantifiable um because there are are racist undertones in policy there's racist undertones in a lot of these conversations that, and people that, view power as a zero-sum game yeah and yeah. people view power as if or rights almost as a zero-sum game at times and if i am empowering or giving rights to this group that means therefore i am taking it from someone else if you view it as a zero-sum game right and so 
people in power will do everything they can mm-hmm. to keep clutch a hold of it. <clears throat> and there's like, go ahead. So I was going to say, what do you think about like this, um, this concept of like socialism or Marxism versus capitalism? Because it's, it's kind of a, a political issue right now. That's a, because I, I'll tell you my view before you jump yeah, off the please. bridge. No. Um, is, uh, me and Bomani actually had a good conversation and, and taxes was brought up, right? So it, it's, I kind of view it like that. There's no way I'm going to spend the amount of money that I've earned in my lifetime. I'm not going to. I'd be super irresponsible if I did, but there's no way I'm going to. So I feel kind of obligated, not necessarily. Um, well, I mean, there there is an, in, in, there's an obligatory, um, uh, I don't know where to put that. I I I don't feel necessarily like I have to do anything, but I I feel like I should do something because of the wealth that I've accumulated. Something like charitable, you mean? No, like, I mean oh. like um, actually being responsible for like like having a bigger burden on my on my table as far as like taxes is concerned. Oh yeah. Um, but the conservative viewpoint is that if you make it, you earn it. And because you've made it, you earn it. Uh, you should get tax breaks and tax cuts because you are then. I understand both sides because then you are you are then employing more people, creating more jobs, thus stimulating the economy. All right. So if I listen, a few things. One is I would, if I had more faith in people, I think I would have a, I would be much less pro redistribute redistribution via taxes if Mm -hmm. i truly believed that you companies would take their tax break and hire people instead of paying dividends to shareholders if i truly believed that people would take a tax break and give more money to charity as opposed to hoarding wealth like then then maybe i would be a little more open to it i also think people that we consider well off say you make a say you make $220,000 $220,000 a year. Right. That's more money than 94, 95% of people ever make in a year. But yeah. you can you can argue if you make 220 grand and you got two kids that are around the same age mm-hmm. and they're bright kids and they both get into really good colleges and but because you're in that you're not going to qualify for any financial aid. Mm-hmm. And the government's saying about half. Mhm. And now that your two kids' colleges, colleges post tax, not pre tax. Right. So you got about one hundred and ten grand take home before right. you spend a dollar, and your two twin daughters or whatever are they both got into Stanford, and you're going to send them, right. and that's all your money for the year. Yeah. You can make the argument you make that much money, you shouldn't have to take out student loan like your kids. So, right, right. so I don't know that we have it right, and I will listen to some arguments on how we could change the tax code, but this is another one where I feel like uh, the the folks have been tricked. And here's what I mean. We talk all the time about welfare cheats and lazy folks on food stamps, all these things. So let me present a different paradigm to you. We have decided in this country, rightly or wrongly, that there is a poverty level and that it, there is a level of income needed to make ends meet. Mm-hmm. And that if you don't make, if you don't get there, we will help you out. We being the taxpayer right. via food stamps, welfare, whatever it is, Section right. 8 housing, and we are footing that bill. We also simultaneously as a country have set what we think the federal minimum wage needs to be. Mm-hmm. That number multiplied by 2,000 hours, which is your full-time employment for the year, mm-hmm. is way short of where one needs to get to qualify for to not qualify for benefits. Mm. So what so so here's an idea. When we set the minimum wage at 750 an hour and we say 21,000 is what you need to not qualify for benefits. Is that what it is, right? I I the I, those are those are gotcha. loose numbers. Gotcha. I apologize. Gotcha. Um I, it depends on if you have kids or family right, whatever. Right, right, right. What we are saying is, "Hey Walmart, we'll pay the rest for you. The taxpayer will." Right. You can employ someone. So we either need to raise the minimum wage or lower the threshold that we say you need to live. Because if we are saying you can work full time at, at the federal minimum wage and not make enough money to live and the taxpayer will pay, we are just paying for Walmart and McDonald's and whomever's doing that. Right. That is the welfare state 
for giant multinational billion dollar corporations. Right. That is the taxpayer footing the bill for those for those corporations. That is offensive. So we I also do believe like I am I am a capitalist, but I I think it is I think society in general can be judged by how it treats its worse off citizens. Mm. I think historically that's a good way like Rome was an amazing society right. for some but we don't look at it the way we look at, I would say, I would say most people would say like modern day Switzerland is more evolved than Rome, even mm. though you look at all those things Rome did. But it's like, yeah, there was like, you know, there's like the gladiators and like right. slaves and it, right. was, it wasn't great. So I, <laughs> um, so I, I'm a true believer that we need to figure out a way that in the richest country in the history of the world that everyone has if they assuming they are able bodied and working a standard of living that is not embarrassing access to healthcare and See, that's access to a legitimate education yeah that's, i mean th these are all and this and this is and so i know that t in today's day that makes me a wild liberal yeah, you're i would super liberal i would remind people <laughs> that 60 years ago the President Obama raised the top marginal tax rate from, I think it was 36.5% to 39%. I might be off a half percent in either direction. Yeah, you screwed me. The, I know. You were, you, you've been a rich guy for a while now. Definitely. I would remind people that around 60 years ago, the top marginal tax rate was 90%. 90%. When was that? The, I, I want to say the late 50s. Jesus. So not that, I mean, I'm not... No, that's, yeah. That, that's, that's real. Yeah. The top marginal tax rate was 90%. Now, I'm not saying we should go to that. Right. Uh, what was the cutoff? Do you know the cutoff the, for that percentage? I think it that I want to say then it was like two hundred and fifty grand, but two hundred and fifty grand and like then yeah. that's you know yeah, I mean, that's yeah. a few million dollars. Yeah. Um, but I just I the, we have we have gotten I I think we have we started to get a little askew in and I will and I just I think it's so easy to vilify individuals instead of looking at systems and like i i do not care well this oh, is the problem of poli this is the problem of politics is you have individuals uh lobbying to directly affect systems in order to benefit from right so you have like lobbyists in and i mean it's it's, it's like it, it's easier to see nowadays than it was back then um, but like nowadays you see lobbyists and bills being passed under the table that directly affect everybody, but, uh, th there's direct interest involved. So this is why it's, it's hard to go back to our original conversation. It's hard to divorce race and politics because there are incentivized human beings that want to keep there. There are And I, I believe this, there are racist human beings that control our, um, uh, the structure of our government, uh, some of parts of it, and they they want to pass bills in order to keep their lineage white. Like it's 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 a white supremacist white supremacist uh, narrative that they are that they are pushing in in Congress, and you see it with shit like uh, gerrymandering. They they want to continue to to keep the power in this in this in this country and and so all of these policies that they're that they're implementing directly affect it and i don't want to go back into the race conversation because I, I i i really enjoy economics but like when you're um what did you make the point about um the, the minimum wage or the <clears throat> social like we just we just can't have it both ways it's, like it, it, maybe you want to make the argument there should be no social safety net that there should be no that not I can't you. See that. No, no, I can't. I can't see that because and and I'm 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 more of uh and and actually I bought the book the the, uh, the Communist uh, Manifesto by Karl Marx. Uh, I want to dig into Marxism. The little bit that I've read um, is fascinating to me, and uh, a lot of the times communism and Marxism is married with the regimes that implemented it. So like uh, Russia and China, yada yada. Um, as as well as a, a lot of atheism as well is 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 married. Well, that's to how those. we that's how we combated it most directly. Is we we the we tie, godless communist right. was like a big part right. of right. But I think there's a a secular way to run a society that is for all that is not um, directly opposed 
to capitalism like they feel like it is. I'm not because because when I when I read a little bit about Marx, uh, Karl Marx and the things that he wanted, he was, and I, I could be wrong if I'm in, if I am in the comment sections, kill me. And I haven't read this book. I bought it. I have it with me, but I haven't read it yet. But basically, what I understand it is is basically saying in capitalism. Uh, what will eventually happen and you kind of see it happening now is that the worker doesn't feel uh worth in their work right and so they will always be disgruntled and the top of the top will always take advantage of that worker and so basically it's he's trying to say that um there should be the distribution of wealth and you find that that take care of basic needs and you find work that you love doing so so i think i think any of these economic systems unchecked doesn't work and i do think the best economic system for the most people to have the highest standard of living and there to be business not just business growth but but technological growth things like that is capitalism i agree but i would remind people that we are not that far removed from the average ceo we're 60 years removed from the average ceo making five times the average worker. Right. And now amongst the top companies, it's around 350 times. I actually like, saw, no, I saw, I saw, I saw this, this, um, it's gotten to me. It has gotten, it, we've gotten out of whack to a degree. Now I grew up in a union household. My dad was president of the firefighters union in Kansas City for 30 years. I grew up on picket lines. My, my dad got sent to jail twice because he struck back before it was legal for firefighters striking Kansas City. Wow. Like I he had to be pardoned by the governor two times. Really? Uh, when I once before I was born, I think once right after I was born. Like I so I understand that a lot of this comes from like you said how you're raised. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just we are going we are starting to see the effects of this. It it is not that long ago in this country that you could have a regular job, blue collar job, mm-hmm. and be able to get a, a good life. home, right. send your kid to college, and be fine. You were never gonna be rich. Yeah, I saw I saw And this. like and now it's that it feels like we are really, really pushing the limits on the divide of how far we can get from what folks have to what like the folks that have it and the folks that don't. Right. And that's a that's a dangerous place. And even I would argue for rich people, it's a dangerous place because that causes people to in desperation. In desperation, everyone's more at risk. Right. A society's less stable. Right. There's there's a lot of things where the you asked me about my opinion on taxes, like I the I, I this back of the napkin. You could sell me on. There, like you enough. could sell me that zero to fifty thousand dollars a year. Your your federal tax rate should be five percent, and that fifty thousand to two hundred thousand, it should be or fifty thousand to one hundred fifty thousand. That that area is ten percent, and then keep going up like that. Yeah. And you could convince me. Now, it actually, oddly enough, would screw pro athletes more than anybody because typically, if you make ten million in a year, you're going to keep making it that as opposed to right. one time thing. But if you want to sell me that once you get north of five million dollars a year, you should be paying ninety cents on the dollar. Yeah, I'd listen to it, and you say, "Oh, it's going to stifle competition." Man, the rich guys aren't buying the fifth Ferrari because they want it. <laughs> it's because the other rich guys got six, yeah. and so if the other rich guys got three, like they, and so that is some people would say, "Well, I was, that- ta- I was talking, I was talking to Neil Brennan, and he kind of said something similar. He said, uh, he said, I've been on a private plane around five times, and he said every single time I've been on a, on a private plane, he said the person that owned it he got off, and we were on the runway, and he goes, "That's the plane I really wanted." Right, and no matter what it would be, <laughs> yeah. Neil Brennan did he write the end of the world? Is that his? Is that Peter Brennan? Neil Brennan? Who's Neil? Sorry, Neil, Neil Brennan is, is his brother. He's a comedian, and he's he, oh, so he uh, definitely not he, the guy he, I was thinking. Of. He co-wrote the the Chappelle Show, and oh, okay, like, he's brilliant. Sorry, the uh, the the Brennan is the it might be his brother. I don't. I mean, I'm not sure. The, was, the, well, the, well, Peter Brennan's definitely a white guy. Uh, yeah, Neil Brennan's white too. Oh, I thought you said he's a brother. I misunderstood you. No, no, no. Oh, okay, my bad. The oh, you said it might be his his brother. Yeah, I understand. His brother, my bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe hey, the the <laughs> the uh. So disregard the question. I just thought it was the, the guy that wrote this yeah. book about extinctions. No, I mean it's it's a uh, it's it's a, it's this forever tug of war with the haves and the have nots that will 
continue to go on. Right now, as it stands, I believe that capitalism is the best system that we have. Um, any kind of uh, modifications towards progression is, I would lean more towards Marxism, but m- Marxism is directly in conflict with capitalism right, of course so it's it's hard i mean I'm, i understand i totally understand both sides when people are like no it'll I, I don't necessarily believe it'll stifle competition or, or stifle innovation i mean that's a, that's that's a big critique of, of marxism because they'll say if everybody has everything what's the incentive to keep inventing and i'm like i mean I, I, I wake up in the morning and i don't i don't have to do a damn thing but right now i'm grinding my ass off to have a, a one of the most successful podcasts like I, there's nothing making me want to do this other than i want to i want to have great conversations with great people like i mean i granted granted it's it's anecdotal but i feel like people who want to invent will invent sure i also i think that is this is a separate conversation but i think that i think sometimes super talented people don't give themselves enough credit for their talent and therefore and i think you see this do do you in back in houston do you remember a guy named greg cook greg cook he did a talk show with indy kalu he was a he was a former football player. Played for the Packers. His last name his... was spelled K O C H. Um, okay. But reg- so this guy played line for the Packers in the '60s or whatever. Then became a lawyer. Then became a successful talk show host. And he hated me. <laughs> and uh, we went to go do TV one day because I had talked a little trash to him on Twitter because he. He had sent out some stupid bumper sticker style meme about okay yeah I seen him um about basically he was upset that wealthy people pay more taxes than poor people right and I and I the and I made fun of him on Twitter and then he and I had a TV appearance at the shortly lived CS in Houston together this is a big man right and and he said to me he's, I'm a t-, he looked me dead in my eye and he said I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen we're gonna go in there and do TV and then at some point we're gonna leave and when we leave we're gonna walk outside. And I'm gonna break your fucking jaw. And, and he didn't seem like he was joking. Because of the meme? And he was, I, because I, no, he sent the meme because I had talked shit to him. Oh. And so, <laughs> and, and I had, and I was like, okay, well, I'll tell you this much. That's not gonna happen. He's like, no, 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 that's gonna happen. And I don't know if he was serious or just trying to intimidate me, but oh, if he was trying to intimidate me, it worked. it worked. And so I was like, let's talk this through. And he told the story of his life, came from nothing. Bootstraps, bootstraps, the whole thing. <laughs> and bootstraps. and I said to him, I was like, Greg, here's the problem. You're not giving yourself enough credit. He said, what do you mean? I was like, you don't recognize how special you are. It's like, you made the NFL. Then you pivoted and got a law degree. Successful lawyer. Then you pivoted and now you're successful talk shows. It's like three very difficult competitive industries. You succeeded in all of them. Maybe it, yes, I'm sure you worked hard. Maybe it wasn't just your hard work, though. Maybe you're special. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're talented. Maybe you have a natural intellect higher than other people's. And for you to say, I did it, why can't you? That, yeah. that, 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 I'm not, percent. right. Like, why, the, 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 to, to say that, that is not giving yourself enough credit. Right. Not everyone is as special as you or as talented as you. No one, would, you would never say, Nick, I can fucking hit that hole. Like, you know what I mean? And run a 4-4, whatever you ran. Why can't you? It's like, no, no, no. I, the, 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 some of that's hard work. Physically and unable. some of that is, <laughs> right. Some of that is, right. I'm gifted. And I and I wish the very talented people sometimes, and successful people, would give themselves more credit. And recognize that I, what I did, everybody can't do. Well, it's it's a, no matter how hard they work. Yeah, I think it's it, special. It's the it's the brainwashing of 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 our country is really what it is. So it's it's like it's like um it's like a coaching analogy where they say like good coaches is not just having great players or having great teams. Good coaches is taking a good player and making them great. You have a bell curve in life. We're all waves. It just is what it is. So you have the majority of people that are just average. You have people who, no matter what they do, are always going to just have low skill set. And you have people that, no matter what they do, they're going to succeed in this life. I, I kind of know where I fall in that. And you have to kind of know. I mean, when you travel, you understand, right? But you understand that most of the people are going to be here. And so there's there's people that are here that are saying, you can be here. Like, no, they can't. Like, intellect is and, and comprehension skills and some of this stuff is just innate. It and just some is of it's it dumb luck. 
Yeah. Uh, Somerville no, is dumb. If you walk. meet anybody successful, there's not one successful person I've ever met that didn't say, yo, I had a little bit of luck on the way. I, I, the, the, I'll, I'll use my, God, I, and I know this has gone on too long, but I'll use my example uh, just from my personal life. I So I, I applied to one college, Syracuse. It was the only place I wanted to go. If I didn't get in, I said I was going to go be a firefighter like my dad. I also, I, I got every academic scholarship available to you at Syracuse, but that only pays half the way. So that's Syracuse about forty grand a year. I had about twenty grand taken care of. My mom stroked the check for the rest of it. Hmm. So as I'm graduating, I had two job offers: one full time with benefits, New York City producer at ESPN Radio; another eight dollars an hour part time, no benefits in Kansas City. But on the weekends, I got to host my own talk show for four hours every Saturday. Because I didn't have the debt, I hmm. took. The Kansas City one. Wow. I knew it was the better opportunity to get me where I wanted to be. I knew it. I didn't earn not having that debt. And to be totally honest, my mom earned it to a degree, but my mom wouldn't have gone to Vassar Johns Hopkins, then Harvard, if her dad hadn't, you know what I mean, done what he did. And by the way, he wouldn't have been able to do what he did if, if he, wa- he was a Jew. I'm not Jewish, but he was a Jewish man in New York City post-World War II, or I guess pre-World War II, started his own business in like a part of New York City where a lot of Jewish people could get in the, the fabrics business, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. If he was a black man in Alabama, like he can't start his own business there. Right. And the, the trickle effect of that goes on forever. 100%. And so I didn't, I do think, listen, my first, when I when I was t- touring Syracuse, the dean of the school told me, you got great scores, got great this, you're going to get in. I'll let you know this, though. You'll never be a radio host. You have a terrible voice. <laughs> Shout him like, out, though. The, the, my guy, Dean Rue. I, I love him. <laughs> uh, said, like, listen, I, I, th- this it's not for you. Uh, I obviously don't have the look to t- be a typical television host. Like, I think I got So you got a radio wear, face? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> voice for newspaper, <laughs> face for radio. I really believe I got to where I am. I didn't play sports at no high level. I because I've lived and breathed it and I've worked as hard as anyone in my field over the last 10 years. I truly believe that and right. I take pride in that. But none of that would have mattered if I left school with 100 grand debt and I took that producer job. Mm-hmm. None of it. Cuz you don't get from producer on, you know, right out of school to where I am at this point. You just don't. Mm-hmm. And I didn't earn that. To quote President Obama, I didn't build that or misquote him. Like I, <laughs> and so at least I take pride in what I've done and what I've accomplished. And I, a lot of it was hard work. Right. A lot of it's good fortune. A lot of it's the time that the, 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 there were four times when I was in high school that I was handcuffed. Only one time did I end up ultimately getting arrested. How much of that was because I was a white kid from the suburbs? Mm. Right? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like a lot of things that have helped me be where I am are, I didn't earn. So I don't, I don't have to apologize to anybody for that. For sure. I, but what I do have to be is hyper aware of it and recognize that. Like I, I tell my kids, I listen, man. I there's, I want to be able to have every channel available to me. I want to be able to eat Chipotle twice a week, and I want to be able to go to very nice dinners. That's all I make my money for. <laughs> Chipotle. That's 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 all. <laughs> Everything after that, I'll give it to my wife and kids. Like they can spend all the money. I, I, I want my kids to be spoiled. I want my son to have fly sneakers. I want my I, I, that is what I make my money for. And I do not apologize for that. But they got it. What I will never forgive myself for them for is if they don't realize how lucky they are. Yeah. If they don't recognize that, if not for the grace of God, there go all of us and pay that shit forward. Like recognize that a lot of this is just dumb luck. Well, see, what you're loosely, and I don't want to get into this at all, but what you're loosely describing is privilege. And, of course, and the fact that you're cognizant of it, it just, it's uh, we need more of that in our society because that's that's the we're, we're trying to fight that that notion right now, man. But dog, I, you've been way more gracious with your time than this. Is an honor, man. I appreciate man. it. I'm happy that and the the record's awesome. I, I really enjoy I it. Congrats that, man. on that. It's a weird spot you're in in that because I feel like being who you are probably helped. The initial publicity, but right. it also set the bar of how good it has to be oh. for people to take it seriously 100%. way higher than otherwise. A thousand percent. And so I'm sure that's a little frustrating, but I think it's really yeah. good. No, um, listen, it. I'm no I'm no music expert, but I enjoy it, and this is great. Every, this everybody's is awesome. a music expert, man. So no, I, I appreciate it, man. Um, I've got it in all the validation I needed. Some of my some of my favorite producers of all time 
have hit me just That's independently dope. and said, yo, this is good work. And so, like, if uh, if I never make another project, which I will, but, uh, you know, it was validation enough for me. But the fact that you gave it a good listen, an honest listen, I, I appreciate it, man. I, I, that's, that's, that was my first love. That was my first for baby. Sure. It was music for sure, man. But I had no idea we had so much in common. I had no idea how like-minded we were and how much more. I mean, I, I, like, I followed you on Twitter after you after you hit me. And and kind of apologize for your uh, your, yeah. your tyrant rant, uh, <laughs> but uh, hey, you know, do you think this will smooth things over between me and your mother? A thousand percent. Okay, a All thousand right. percent. It's an odd thing to ask a guy. Do you think your mom will <laughs> like me after this? But I think you know what I mean. No, no, my, mom's mom's is an avid lift, listener of the podcast, and she okay. um yeah she uh yeah she she'll definitely she'll reach out, man. She'll definitely reach out. She's awesome. she's she's good people, man. Very forgiving human being. Um, but like I said, man very like-minded human being and even if you weren't dog just the fact that how you arrived to your conclusions and how genuine you are i appreciate it we didn't touch on a lot of the topics i wanted to hit because like you're an nba guru that's your it's your profession and i wanted to talk about that a lot but we had a very important conversation so maybe we could do a round two yeah another time yeah, we, we can do talk a, sports we can do a round okay. right we can do a round two man um but uh if, if you're a fan of the podcast man we we try to end it the same way every time jim carrey my guy and so we're trying to we're trying to get him we're going to put a compilation video sooner or later because we're coming up on a year in october november is when we first started so we're gonna put this gonna put this out and put the pressure on man so if you could lobby for your for your dog and the camera man i'd appreciate it all right listen mr carrey uh i'm not sure how much of a football fan you are how much you know mr foster's career or his secondary career in music or the tertiary career podcasting but here's what you need to know I don't know of any other podcast that will not only invite you on in any form, but if you want to come on as Andy Kaufman, I'm sure he'd take you. If you want to come on as a character you're developing, sure he'd take you. If you want to come on, I would say drunk, sure he'd take you. <laughs> Listen, just I, why would you not come on one of the most interesting, fun podcasts? I sat here. Listen, and if you don't want to talk about acting, I I talk about sports for a living. I people I walk by the I walk down the street. People don't know my name. They're like, "You're the LeBron James guy." I just talked to him for two hours. <laughs> by the grace of God, he never even mentioned LeBron James. He'll let you set the topics. Come on the podcast. Come on, Jim. Man, I appreciate it, man. Much love, man. Absolutely. So, if anybody that don't know if you can find, where can they find you, man? All right. So the mornings on FS1. If you're, it's not even that new of a channel anymore. It's the channels that got Skip and Shannon, Colin Coward. We've had a bunch of the World Cup games, so at this point, you should know the channel. Six thirty. 30, 9 30 a.m eastern if you're not a tv watcher follow me on twitter at get nick right appreciate it man much love man i appreciate you coming on